Hi, and welcome to Connect and Collaborate. I am Alex Hopkins, your on-air producer. And today we are very excited. We are talking para-reform. I have in studio with me Chris ba Brown, not the rapper, don't be confused. He is the original Chris Brown, the Director of Policy and Research for the Common Sense Policy Roundtable. And on the phone I have with me Buzz Koble. He is the President and CEO of Koble and Company. Um, but he is also the co-founder and on the board of directors for the Common Sense Policy Roundtable. And the reason that we are here today is because uh, CSPR, as I'm going to refer to it from now on, Please do. Um, they have uh, created this REMI partnership. And so they've done a study on PARA, and they did it on behalf of this REMI partnership that includes CSPR, Colorado Concern, Denver South Economic Development Partnership, the Colorado Bankers Association, and the Colorado Association of Realtors. Um, so I'm going to start out very basic here for me. Um, I don't know what para is. I will be the first to say that. Um, I'm not a native to Colorado. I know it's about retirement, and that is the extent of my knowledge. So if you want to give me just a basic layman's terms, what is para? Sure, I'd be happy well, para, to. Please, please go ahead, oh, Buzz. Go ahead, Chris. Please go ahead. No, go ahead, Buzz. <laughs> Well, uh, Chris can add in on it, but the PARA is basically the largest, and it is the retirement fund for over 200,000 currently active public employees in Colorado. Um, and so it, it really is that organization that wraps around what all of their, their benefits are and primarily related to what their long-term retirement benefits are. Lovely. Thank you. I do appreciate that. Um, and so, Buzz, if you could continue for me. Actually, um, let's step back a little bit and let's get a background here of what CSPR is, what you guys do, how you're, what was the reason for founding it in the first place? Yeah, I, I think that's a great start. Um, we felt that there, those of us that founded it felt that there was a huge void out there in, in factual information to help the public debate. So CSPR is a 501c3 nonprofit educational organization. We like to think of ourselves sort of as a free enterprise think tank uh, dedicated to the protection and promotion of jobs and the economy in Colorado. So that's really our focus. We don't get involved in a bunch of other items. But we're totally nonpartisan, which means we're not an advocacy organization, but we're here to promote our name, Common Sense Solutions for the Economic Issues Facing Colorado. And we think that, that we're the only one that has a dynamic model, which is really important in a free market economy, a dynamic model to give the kind of information to politicians in the business community that will facilitate what we believe is a much more robust and factual discussion and debate about those issues around jobs and the economy. Thank you, Buzz. I appreciate that. And so being a part of CSPR, why PARA? Why get involved so hard on PARA? Uh, good question. Uh, PARA is, right now, I think PARA is maybe the singular most important and large fiscal issue that needs to be dealt with in this state. Um, PARA is an important organization because um, they do serve the retirement benefits of so many public employees. It, and, and it's important because they are uh, provide incentives for uh, people who want to work in the public sector. But right now, we believe the reason this is so important that there's a huge, massive imbalance between what I w we would consider in the private sector very generous benefits offered by PARA um, and which includes state agencies, the local governments, and school districts, as compared to what really exists out there um, in, in the private sector. So this is a looming problem that has continued to get worse uh, over the last 20 years, and we are basically out of time uh, to try and get this once and all resolved. And I think there's a fundamental issue here that most Coloradans don't understand, <clears throat> and that is that a lot of times it's referred to as employer contribution and, and what the employers are paying into the system. But because it's public employees, what, what the people of Colorado need to understand is the taxpayers, us, we are the employer. We're the ones that pay the taxes that fund all of these various 
public organizations. And uh, there's been some efforts, and we'll talk more about it later, to try and get some of these issues solved. But what, what is looming out there right now is a, a $32 billion unfunded liability that's an obligation um, of the state. Um, but this is an issue that's statutory, which means that it has to be dealt with at the legislature, which obviously raises the issue. It can get a lot more political. Um, but this is a looming problem that is going to be costly for all taxpayers in Colorado. And when you have such a sizable unfunded liability, what that does is that's an amount that continues to figure out, need to figure out how it gets paid off um, and, and get funded. And what that's doing is that's crowding out dollars that can be utilized for so many other important things in our state, including pay raises for existing current employees in the public system um, and crowds out the ability to fund the much needed and long overdue uh, infrastructure, particularly transportation for roads and bridges. Um, and it also crowds out important things back to education, such as the need for maybe smaller classrooms, the need for new school facilities. And the more money we continue to have to deal with this unfunded liability, the more it's going to take away from current and longer term needed services and educational requirements here in the state. So, so it's looming. It's important to get it solved right now. And that's a little scattering of things that why we think it's so important. And Chris, you might see if you've got any other things to add to that as well. No, Buzz, I think you, you nailed it. Uh, really, just maybe to add a little bit, I think Buzz, Buzz touched on it, but there's uh, the, the basic issue is, uh, and the, the significance is that it does provide a, a benefit, a retirement, you know, security to the state's workforce, um, which is significant. But as the unfunded liability, the, the promise for payments out uh, against what actual uh, investment and expect, invest, uh, expected investment returns Para uh, is getting, um, that unfunded liability has significant crowding out effects, as Buzz pointed out, that has forced the taxpayer contribution, the annual amount of money that goes in to, to fund Para to, to substantially increase, more than double over the last 10 years. And just in the fall of last year, uh, one credit rating agency that, that was uh, rating the, the, the state's credit indicated that they were going to potentially put the state on a negative look uh, outlook because of the uh, continual problem, the continual growth in the unfunded liability. So it matters uh, to the state budget, to the local budget, to schools, um, and it matters for the state's ability to borrow and continue to service debt elsewhere beyond beyond Paris. So this is a significant, significant issue um, for for all involved, not just the Paris members, but but taxpayers uh, more broadly. Absolutely. So so let me let me add, let me add something to that, Alex, if I could. Um, just that one subject about the credit rating issue. If we lose or get our credit rating reduced, that means that that anything that needs to be financed through the public arena in the state that's backed by the state uh, will have a higher interest rate, which means we will be unnecessarily paying a whole lot more for physical facilities. Let's call it facilities up at the University of Colorado or the Colorado School of Mines or some of the, if we bond for roads and these other things. So the interest rate increase could have a dramatic effect that even exacerbates the problem we've talked about. Wow, I don't think I ever realized that the that the state had a credit rating too. You bet. Absolutely. They yeah. borrow a lot more money than us. Yes, I would assume so. So my, my student loans will pale in comparison. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so I do have a question here. Um, so uh, what about if employers or employees, I should say, turn to an IRA instead? How does that factor in to this para? Uh, Buzz, if you'd like to answer that for me. Well, um, I think r right now there isn't necessarily that choice. Okay. And Chris will, Chris will help me with this, but with the new legislation, and I'm hoping what's in there in the end will be the opportunity for employees to select 
a defined contribution program that allows them to go into more of a 401k and invest it where they want. Um, but, but I think as of right now, that's, that's not an option. Is that safe to say, Chris? That's, that's right. For the, for the, within the state division, there are certain employees within this. There's five divisions of para. Okay. Uh, and, and so there's different segments of employment types that each contribute to their own division. Uh, and within the state division, the, uh, part, there are some uh, individuals that are, have an option for a 401k style defined contribution plan. But what Buzz is talking about and within the current uh, legislation that was passed out of the Senate and being discussed in the, in the House includes, currently includes a provision to include a defined contribution, a 401k style plan for the school division. Um, and so uh, I think it's an important distinction to make for those that everyone is saving for retirement, but I think it's an important distinction to make between a defined benefit plan and a defined contribution plan. So PARA is a defined benefit plan where uh, it's a hybrid, but where a new employee signs up, when they sign up, they are uh, given uh, or promised a certain level of retirement based on different calculations of their highest average salary, um, based on the age that they retire, the amount of service time that they've accrued, but they are promised a, 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 a amount for the rest of their life after they retire. Okay. And so this 401k style plan uh, would be an option to contribute along the way to continue to, to contribute uh, along the way uh, with each paycheck. But then um, you would have more flexibility in terms of being able to take that money out. And upon retirement, you would be drawing from your own account rather than um, relying on whatever the structure of the benefit was at the time. Fantastic, thank you. And just for my own curiosity, um, I, one of the things that we continually see in retirement funds, right, we're living longer than ever. Technology yeah. and medi medical care has caught up with us, and so we're able to live longer. Is para affected by that as well? You know, I, I, that is a huge issue, and I'll put that under the umbrella, Alex, of the realities of the new world that haven't been incorporated into para. And I think the first one is 70 is the new 60. Yes, people are living longer and they're working longer, but with Terra, they haven't advanced that. And so what happens is they've got defined benefits that they're going to get over now a much longer period of time that was originally projected 20 or 30 years ago. And also people are working longer. So that very issue is part of the realities that, that we need to deal with. But I think there's some other realities that, that, that kind of go with that. And we talked about the defined benefit, and Chris mentioned that it has to do with your number of years of service and your age and all those various calculations. But when it does that, it is a defined benefit. And with that, there are guarantees that come with that. And when you don't meet the investment returns that were projected, that's partially how the, the unfunded liability continues to increase. And so some of the realities are right now uh, the employers or these, these public agencies pay 20.15% of the total benefit cost. That really, in reality, is probably double what the private sector pays. So those of us in the private sector and wanting to use common sense have to say, well, wh why should they be paying so much more, particularly when it's taxpayer dollars? And there's another stat that we, we, that we uncovered as part of this study effort. Right now, only 62% of American workers receive any kind of employer match uh, when they save for retirement. And what, what the pair members are getting is a significant employer contribution plus their own match. But because of this huge, large, unfunded liability, a large piece of that actually is going to pay down the unfunded liability and not necessarily getting at the end of the day to the desired results of the individuals in their retirement. And Chris, you probably have something <laughs> to add to that as well. <laughs> no, uh, again, Buzz, you're on top of it. I, I, I think it's an important question you asked to, to, to get that started related to retirement ages. And, and the, I think the current retirement age structure for pair members 
is, is it does not reflect the the demographic realities and, and is certainly well below you know even social security to to receive uh, substantial or full benefits but I think it's an important point if I can get this right and, and <laughs> see if people can if, if I can get us through this but since the last reform to para the unfunded liability or the number that everyone's talking about buzz mentioned is 32 billion dollars in terms of the commitments the, the 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 money that is projected not to be there in terms of what the commitments are um, I should say that pair is not projected to run out of money but the in terms of the commitment they'll be able to make payments over year under under current projections but the point is that since the last set of reforms the assumptions have changed right. Para has had to change the assumptions in terms of lifespans and the assumed target rate of return and the, the assumed rate of return in terms of their annual investment, the average annual investment growth has uh, the, the investment return assumption has come down and the age of retirement has uh, the assumption has gone up. And those two things have increased the unfunded liability because found out the system was not contributing enough and assume that there was going to be substantially lower costs than there actually now are projected to be. And that has caused this unfunded liability to grow. So those two things are really important to understand that, that the assumptions have changed in the interim since the last reform, uh, making the cost go up. At the same time, there has been no reforms to curtail or to get the benefits in line during that time frame. Okay. I think you explained that well. Don't worry, I followed you all the way through and I think our listeners have as well. Um, one of the last things I guess I want to ask here is the what what are some of the benefits of solving this problem, Buzz? Well, I think first and foremost, as I mentioned earlier, it's it we need to correct the system such that I would say two things. The the amount of money that gets put in ultimately will get to the current workers who are going to ultimately retire at some point in the future. So so we need the dollars not to continue paying down this unfunded liability. But probably the bigger picture is if you look at the amount of money that is taken to uh, help pay down or have the increased cost to, uh, for the obligations, um, that's the amount of money that can be utilized for, as I mentioned earlier, these the bridges and roads and infrastructure and the schools and facilities. But we, when we have this significant amount, and I think right now it's estimated that there's a, there's a 720 billion annually that that gets allocated uh, for this, and, and and we can get into a little more detail about that. But those kind of dollars, literally, could um, 720 million that, that could bond. 8 million of infrastructure, which is almost the equivalent of what our problem is in the state. Or it could, um, our study also shows that it could give a, a salary, a compensation salary increase to virtually every one of the public employees of $3,500 a year. So when you look at the inability to give pay raises, to build infrastructure that's needed for the growth in Colorado, to, to do better things in the, in the schools with smaller classrooms and better facilities and better equipment that they need. That's what's getting crowded out. And, uh, and I think the other issue that, again, the Colorado voters do not understand is then kind of, they are sort of unknowingly part of a contract that, that is going to require that obligation to fall on the taxpayers if we don't solve the problem. And I, we don't think it's appropriate for the taxpayers to be on the hook for a continually expanding um, uh, unfunded liability uh, that they don't even really know about when there's ways to try and solve this problem today. And th this wasn't done knowingly or in bad faith by people. It was simply a collision of a lot of the variables that were being utilized working against uh, the system that was set up on defined benefits such that it continued to increase uh, the unfunded liability. So that whole issue, we keep using the term, it's crowding out a lot of other things that are very important for the taxpayers who are also the employers of all the public employees. And we need to reach a much better balance with that. And if we don't start it now, we're going to be in big trouble down the road. Even though they tried it in 2004 and 2006, they thought they had some solutions. 
um, the legislature passed things, it's only gotten worse since then. So it's proven we got to find the right solutions and do it right now. Absolutely. And so I guess one question that I, I have, um, and I will pose this to both of you, whoever wants to answer, um, you're right, this is common sense. We can clearly see yep. that if we take care of para reform, we can push funds to other um, areas within the government that need that, right? Transportation is huge. Education is huge with the legislative here in Colorado. So what do you think is holding legislation back from pushing this para reform forward? Well, um, unfortunately, I think it's the lack of education, which we're trying to do, and understanding of both the electorate and the taxpayers, as well as many of our legislators um, down at the state capitol. And I think this is a complicated enough issue that there there is a lot of misinformation out there about who's really going to get hurt with this. And there's fears that it's going to hurt the retirees who have a fabulous benefit program already. And there's not near enough talk um, about what's really consequential for the long-term benefit of the state and its taxpayers who pay all the public employees. So I think a lot of it is the information that we're trying to get out right now as part of what we do with common sense policy. Anything you'd like to add to that? No, I, I think it's, um, I think Buzz, Buzz hit it on the head. I mean, I think uh, part of it is, and you know, again, thank you for the opportunity here. I think the, yeah. uh, once people do understand, I think, what the moving parts are and the fact that um, in this reform effort in its current form and, and through our research and some of our, our findings, which we may get into, we're, we're trying to come up with a sensible way to preserve the fundamental you know, promise that has been made uh, that has been found out to be immensely more expensive and costly than originally thought, um, but preserving that. And so I think there's a lot of vested interests, a lot of stakeholders in this um, that are quite vocal whenever you, and as Buzz, you know, use the term that there is, there is sacrifice, there is uh, at any, as, as the unfunded liability has grown, the, the need for reform has only meant ultimately uh, either increasing costs or reducing benefits, both of which are incredibly challenging to do. And, and um, uh, you know, while the taxpayer and employer contribution has, has gone up, I think it's, it's, it's a time where the unfunded liability has continued to grow. They're looking at other ways to, to shore up the solvency, to shore up the unfunded liability and ultimately eliminate it over the next 30 or 40 years. Um, and, and people are hurt by this. And, and I think uh, educating on what the numbers really say and what the numbers look like is, again, our mission and something we hope uh, kind of informs and help people come to a very similar conclusion as, as, uh, as you might just have. Absolutely. And, and I'll add to uh, conclude what Chris said. In the next segment, you'll talk more about the details of this study. Uh, our study is not here to take away the promises that people had. We're trying to find common sense solutions that take Consider, they give consideration to the past promises, but what do we need to do right now, particularly with other employees, new employees, and current employees going forward, to better manage the system so we don't have this train wreck down the road? Wonderful. Thank you for those thoughts, gentlemen. And where can people find, find out more? How can they get involved? Absolutely. You can, we, we've posted everything on our website, so all the resources, the report is on our website, an executive summary uh, are on our website, along with some of the other work that we've done. That's uh, commonsensepolicyroundtable.org. And so we post it on behalf of our partners. Uh, please go there, seek us out. Our contact information is there as well. Send us an email if you have questions. Fantastic. Thank you, gentlemen. We will be right back after this break. Stay with us here on Connect and Collaborate. Welcome back to Connect and Collaborate. I am Alex Hopkins, your on-air producer. And uh, thanks for sitting through the commercial break with us. We're excited to, dump, to jump right back in with the Common Sense Policy Roundtable on para reform. And just uh, to reiterate to our listeners, we have with us Chris Brown, who's the Director of Policy and Research at CSPR. And we also have Buzz Koble, who is the President and CEO of Koble and Company, but he is also the co-founder and part of the Board of Directors for CSPR. And the reason that we're talking today with them is because, para, um, because CSPR did a study on para, on the behalf of a REMI partnership. And in that REMI partnership is the Common Sense Policy Roundtable, 
Colorado Concerns, Denver South Economic Development Partnership, the Colorado Bankers Association, and Colorado Association of Realtors. Um, so I'm just going to get down to business here with you, Chris. And you mentioned in the last segment that there are five divisions of PARA. Does this study hit all five of those? So the, the study, the motivation for the study was to first educate ourselves and then educate through the paper on the different moving parts. So the the study itself absolutely looks at each division. Uh, and I'll say that each division uh, is is funded at different levels and has different um, uh, benefit structures, slightly bene potentially di slightly different benefit structures. Um, but I think it's notable that the, the two most significant are the state division, or the state that represents state employees, and the school division that represents all local uh, school school districts. So, uh, and I mentioned that, that the motivation for the paper, again, and, and the research that we did was to try to present uh, a sort of a sensible path forward and, a, and a, some sensible insights into the financials. Para is a, is a financial management institution that is governing and overseeing one of the largest, uh, the, the maybe possibly even the single largest investment in the state. And um, while we don't offer sort of targeted solutions per each division, we, we want to ensure that, uh, that overall the system uh, is solvent. And, and that equation, as I mentioned, is that the contributions in plus the expected investment returns ultimately has to equal the, the expected benefit payments plus ongoing expenses to run. And so we, we took a very um, sort of pragmatic numbers only look at this to try to understand uh, what is contributing to the unfunded liability, where does the cr uh, current system stand. But yes, yeah, so ultimately you have to understand it on a division by division basis. Absolutely. Thank you for answering that. Um, so the study itself, uh, when did you start and when did your results come in? Well, this organization has it, been something that, that uh, CSPR has looked at for several years and has come out with various uh, insights and, and research. Last year released some work directly related to the uh, assumed target rate of return or, or what would be uh, sort of another way to look at or, or we took a, a, a look across various um, other forecasts for what the long-term rate of assumption, rate of return could be given the current portfolio allocation and projected portfolio allocation for para. So previously, we put out some work that, that just focused on that individual segment to para, which is quite a significant component, the, the long-term investment outlook, and it's, it's crucial for how these uh, plans are priced. But this time, this go-around, we, we saw a real... Uh, opportunity given the discussion, given the para board of directors opened the door to the debate um, uh, within a legislative framework uh, in the fall, offering their own set of reforms, recognizing that their projections, the unfunded liability under the current structure was only going to continue to grow, and the f funded ratio or the ratio of the amount of money that they are projected to have against the uh, ongoing um, benefit payments was going to decline and at a level that, as we talked about in the first segment, credit rating agencies don't look too uh, kindly on. So they really opened the door to the discussion, uh, putting out a set of reforms, and we highlight that in our paper. And uh, and then the governor in his budget, original budget, uh, put out uh, his own set of uh, reforms, adopting many of the provisions within the, the paraboard's suggestions, but made a, a very clear distinction. Uh, and, and in his budget uh, request ultimately said enough is enough when it comes to the taxpayer increase in the contributions, the annual contributions. And, and, and while Para had recommended a 2% increase for uh, all divisions in the taxpayer or the employer contribution rate, the governor, um, while adopting many other reforms, um, suggested that this, the, the statutory rate, the the rate in statute, should not uh, go up any further than it already than it already has in recent history, and and so we we took both of those the framework uh, in terms of reforms, uh, but really believe that um, that 
that the, not only the para opened the door to discussion, the governor uh, made it very clear in his budget uh, what the, the, the discussion should be centered around. And so while we hope to educate and, and for those that want to uh, dig into understanding the different moving parts, also offer some other scenarios, some other options for reform uh, possibly moving forward. So we, I should say that we also released this uh, in the first week of March, coincidentally, pure coincidence, whether good luck or bad luck, <laughs> the same day that the original Senate Bill uh, 200 was introduced. And so um, we don't directly speak to that in our, in our paper, but the underlying discussions and the underlying uh, issue around the taxpayer contribution uh, is central to this report and is central to the debate currently. Absolutely. Do you want to um, give us some specific points in the study, some of these big ticket items that you want to point out for our listeners? All right, where do I start? <laughs> um, yeah, so it was, it was uh, you know, I say I had the unfortunate opportunity of digging through all these financial statements, but no, I, I, I loved it, the opportunity and to really dig into it and, and share some of these insights. And I think there's a couple that were quite striking um, just sort of off the top of my head, one, you know, we talked a little bit about the assumed rate of return and the, the way that through the actuarial process or the projections that Para uses to estimate their growth and their investment accounts and their ability to pay out uh, includes a, a target rate of return assumption around 7.25, currently at 7.25, which over the history of Para has come down from, I think even over 9%, but just within the last 10 years was at 8.5%, at the assumption. Uh, since 2001, the average annual rate of return has been just 6.14%. So while Para will, uh, requires a much longer time horizon than just 2000, I, I go back that far only because uh, that's how far back the financial statements on their uh, website are posted too. But, um, you know, a, an average of 6.14%, and that's with, uh, with you know, one major uh, recession, uh, but some pretty good um, economic times and some incredible financial growth, particularly in the stock market during that time period. And so uh, we, we looked at not only the historic rate of return and the assumptions there, but really what is critical for pricing this out is the, the projected rate of return and the assumption of 725 and whether that is reasonable. And we, again, looked at some other financial projections from other uh, credible institutions on their long-term look outlook for various asset classes and uh, came really nowhere close to the 725 rate of return. So in the paper, we highlight some some averages but uh, and, and give some reasons why Para might outperform even the averages put out by these other institutions. But I think um, it was pretty jarring to see that the average annual, again, just over the last 15 years, has been well below the, excuse me, 18 years, has been well below the, the target rate. And this is the reason why it's come down in statute. So that was one critical finding. I'll, um, one more that really stuck out was if you look at just the average benefit for para members, existing members, versus the average benefit for retirees, um, the average benefit for retirees has gone up faster in the sense that it has grown faster in every financial report um, over the last three, five, seven years, and, and even more over the last 10 years, I highlight five years in the report, faster than the average pay for existing members. And so while para retirees are guaranteed uh, most para retirees those hired before 2007 are, are virtually guaranteed a two percent increase every year in their benefit uh, teachers state workers local government um, uh, the average growth in their pay has been less than retirees as uh, that's partially because of overall budget constraints uh, and and partially because these contributions for the employer have gone up by on average 1% every year over the last 10 years, crowding out what would be pay for our existing sort of state workforce. And so, um, you know, there's a real uh, difference in the pay increases for our current workers, our current workforce against the retirement benefits. So those, those two were just some of the findings that really stuck out for us and we highlight, highlight in the report. Fantastic. So, um, as we know, we've mentioned in the last segment uh, quite a few times all of the other um, government benefits that would 
really benefit, right? The transportation, education, other sectors that we could put this money towards. Um, do you highlight exactly how that's done in this study? So I, I think what's important to understand is a significant amount of every of all the money that is going in to the system every year is going exclusively to pay down that unfunded liability, to pay off the cost of past commitments. So the unfunded liability, again, is the cost of a past commitment that is not expected to be funded. And so uh, all the contributions that are going to, or excuse me, um, currently there are additional contributions beyond this employer statutory rate, the AED and the SAED. These are two additional equalization disbursements that were created by PARA and increased by the legislature to exclusively pay down the unfunded liability. According to sort of the way the financial statements look is that that's not even enough. And so uh, in each, with each person that is contributing, more of that employer contribution is going to pay off the unfunded liability. So it's more than the $720 million a year that Buzz mentioned in the first segment um, that is, ex again, exclusively going, it's, it's probably upwards of well over a billion dollars, um, exclusively paying off the unfunded liability, not going to the service that is being, it's being accrued on behalf of. Um, uh, I think, it's, I think uh, it's an incredible challenge to parse out exactly where that money ultimately is coming from by division, by employer, and the employers uh, ultimately have discretion sort of in how they move their budgets to, to do this. But there is no doubt that um, within the state division and within our local government that, that money is, uh, could be used elsewhere, as we talked about, to pay teachers more, to improve schools, facilities, capital projects, um, to bond infrastructure. So uh, we don't detail exactly where this is coming out in the budget, but I think that's part of the problem and part of the uh, difficulty in, in understanding PARA and the way that financials are reported and the way the budgets uh, are reported, uh, that that trying to ascertain exactly where it's coming from is, is, is quite clouded. Absolutely. Um, uh, you know, uh, Alex, I might just add one thing to of kind of wrap, wrap, this is Buzz again, uh, wrap up a little what Chris said. The one thing that a lot of people don't understand is because it's a defined benefit, and Chris mentioned that they had a 6.14% return over a 10-year period of time, even though they projected 8.5. They've now dropped it to 7.25. But every percentage for a huge fund like Terra that you don't achieve to what you've promised, that then continues to add to the unfunded liability. It's not any other fund in the private sector, if the stock market went down, your investments went down, you just ended up with less and you hope the market comes back. It's a big difference when there's a promise out there to pay and guarantee a certain amount. That's been the issue. And if you don't, if you don't modify the other variables, whether it's the age of retirement or the cost of living increase or how much the employees pay in, if you don't change some of those variables, the problem just continues to get worse. Absolutely. Um, I can definitely see how this is a huge problem. What is your goal with this study? Are you, who are you trying to actually get to with the study to show them that we can fix this? We can have para reform that works for everybody. Well, uh, you know, I think that there's uh, a significant... Uh, we're trying to make the case and educate as to why this is important, why this matters. So we think um, that, uh, again, as our as our overarching issue with CSPR is to really inform. There's, a, there's an incredible amount of very Im significant and, and important decisions that the state uh, is making through its legislative process or asking voters directly to make. And so, again, our mission is to, to inform uh, while... Para uh, directly administers uh, benefits to to its members, and therefore they are very familiar with the structure and what they are getting. I think the ultimately the the other side of this, the taxpayer, the employer cost, the ultimate cost, I think is again not as well understood. So we're hoping that again through this report uh, and talking to you today and some of the other other efforts is to really again make the case for the over three million 
uh, uh, I guess well over three, four million Coloradans that are not para members that, uh, that this is significant for its future, uh, the future of Colorado and the future of education and, and our infrastructure investment and many, many other priorities of the state. So again, it's, it's, it's hoping to, to educate, recognize there is this very significant debate currently mm -hmm. going on in the legislature and, and having an opportunity to understand the moving parts and, and, and weigh in where, where possible. Thank you for that. Um, are there any other parts of this study that you really want to get out there today for this audience? Um, so part of, part of what we offered in, in the report was uh, some, some alternatives and okay. some alternative ways to look at the different moving parts. Um, and, and again, echoed in many ways, uh, again, taking up from what the para board originally proposed related to uh, retirement age, uh, relate, related to the um, <clears throat> uh, calculation of highest average salary, um, related to employee contributions. So we offer a set of alternatives that weighs um, the what the board has put out, what the governor originally put out against uh, what we've termed as, as Hickenlooper Plus, building off of the ideas I talked about earlier in terms of um, no more on the taxpayer side. And, and even uh, in these alternatives, we even offered a path forward where you could even begin to draw down the employer contribution, the taxpayer contribution share. So uh, we put out a couple uh, scenarios as I'll, as I'll put it, that, that ultimately drove down the cost over the next five years, which would bring us back simply to where we were two years ago. So we're not looking at, uh, we, we didn't put out uh, major draconian changes. Uh, this was simply putting the employer cost where it was roughly two, three years ago. Um, that frees up against uh, a status quo of over two billion dollars over the next ten years, and then against a, a, a scenario in which you would increase, mm -hmm. again increase the employer contribution, would save over four billion dollars. And so, we think that again within this debate, there's a lot of emphasis around the benefits and the benefit structure and what this means for for the existing members. And and I think um, you know it's 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 a it's a sad fact of the growing unfunded liability that it ultimately does hurt our future uh, workforce, our future teachers as benefits begin to have to come down and, and cut because of uh, where contracts are and or previous commitments. Um, but through that, we also think that there's a path forward again to to begin to lower the, the contribution for, for taxpayers that frees up significant taxpayer dollars, again, that, that can be used in, in other priorities that you know, are being debated uh, just as heavily in our state legislature and throughout, throughout our, our state. Wonderful. Those are great facts. Can I find this study somewhere? Is, this is published. You said it came out the first week of March. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You can find our full study uh, at commonsensepolicyroundtable.org. Uh, right. You can find my email there as well if you have specific <laughs> questions. And for those of your listeners who want to dig into the numbers and understand the moving parts, I'd be more than happy to, to, to engage in that. Um, but yeah, we, you can find the full, full study, the executive summary, uh, along with some of our other work at commonsensepolicyroundtable.org. Uh, Fantastic. Along with that, I want to ask you if there's anything that's um, coming up that you would like to update listeners on that CSPR has going on at this time. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, so there's a lot of work that we've we've done recently around issues related to. So we're, we're moving on from para. Yes. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, so I think, th again, this organization has been, been very interested in understanding the economic implications of some growing efforts throughout the region to, uh, I'll, I'll say, artificially restrict, but uh, art uh, ultimately cap and restrict residential housing growth. So there was an issue that came up in the city of Lakewood. We, cr we, we put out a study uh, in uh, October, November of last year called Building Gated Cities that looked at the economic issues in the city of Lakewood if this 1% growth cap were to were to be imposed. And, and this is an issue that through the ballot process may actually show up uh, in front of voters this, this fall that oh, wow. would impose 
a cap, again, a, a restriction, a limitation across uh, 10 front range counties impacting the largest metropolitan areas uh, throughout the state of Colorado, Denver, Colorado Springs, Fort Collins, um, and every uh, city, uh, Boulder uh, in between, although Boulder already has a similar uh, ordinance, but nonetheless would, would uh, restrict the ability to grow and add housing at a time when affordability uh, is on the tip of everyone's tongue and, and is at a critical uh, point that's impacting growth and economic prosperity. So we we will shortly have another study that comes out and looks at the issue of of housing growth and particularly capping residential housing growth to where we lose the the residential investment and we now constrain the housing market even more than it is um, only putting more and more pressure on prices and squeezing out more and more dollars from our from our disposable income absolutely I know that I'm I'm in that factor right now I'm renting still I'm trying to save up for a down payment and every time I look it's gone up another hundred thousand dollars the average housing cost right now is just shy of half a million dollars in the Denver area yeah, it's incredible, and and I think the real problem again that we we highlighted in Lakewood that that we'll, we'll we've seen again in the results as we look out across every single of these counties I mentioned, every ten county, um, and every metro area is that the issue is not necessarily the rising price as much as it is incomes are not keeping pace, and so what we're really seeing is is income growth at somewhere around ten fifteen percent over the last uh, again uh, an increase over the last. Uh, eight, nine years, just 10%, 15% higher than where it was, while home prices have grown 60, 70, 80% during that time frame. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that is, again, putting an incredible amount of pressure on, on, on renters, on first-time home buyers, mm -hmm. and, uh, and is, a, is an incredible uh, issue that, again, will be directly in front of voters. This will be put potentially, likely put, directly put in front of uh, listeners and, and Colorado citizens to weigh in on um, a path forward for growth, uh, mm -hmm. one that sort of uh, gets around local control and gets around local permitting process and really puts us up to a, an arbitrary cap on across every county. Yeah. So when it, what I'm hearing here is that we need our bosses to give us raises so that we can <laughs> afford this. That's not in the study. <laughs> yeah. um, Buzz, while you're with us and we have you, uh, is there anything that you're excited about coming up with uh, CSPR? Well, I think uh, obviously the growth issue and, and the restrictions on growth is huge, particularly because we're in the real estate development business, but it doesn't just affect our business. It affects uh, all layers of the state and the economic engine. So we're excited about that. We've got a K through 12 study that will be coming out at some point. But I want to use kind of what Chris said there at the end. What we did is, the, is Para came up with their suggestions as solution. The governor came up with his suggestions. We analyzed those, but what we try and do at Common Sense is we analyzed four different permutations of that to get to a point where we could show, particularly the legislators, that there's even additional ways to change some variables to improve how quickly we'll solve this unfunded liability. And this is all part of the education process that we do at Common Sense. So uh, we continue to do these studies. They've been picked up by the Wall Street Journal and, and a number of national publications as well as the local ones. And this is what we try and do, educate our electorate and our business community and the legislators. Thank you so much, gentlemen. It has been a pleasure having you on the show today. And again, folks, if you are a voter here in Colorado, you need to get on commonsensepolicyroundtable.org, check out this study and more, and be sure to like and subscribe our YouTube page and find this podcast and more at cobrt.com slash radio. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day. Thanks, Alex.